Well, Father, I truly do thank you for the the joy in the atmosphere. I thank you, Father God, for just for you, for what you do for each and every one of us every day. I thank you, Father God, that you are so desperate in love with us. That you're with us continually, day in and day out, urging us to keep going and to not give in. And tonight, Father God, I'm just asking you to just to drop down a special blessing upon your people. A blessing that they can't contain according to your word. And Father God, with this blessing, let them move forward into the things that you want them to move forward into. And Father, I thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Tonight I'm going to speak about in holy fear be prepared. And I'm talking about the judgments and everything God is going to bring upon the land. Let's start with Genesis chapter 6, verse 5. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. So the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth both man and beast, creeping thing and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them. I mean, he was upset, right? But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. This is a genealogy of Noah. Noah was a just man, perfect in his generations. Noah walked with God. And Noah begot three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. The earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. So God looked upon the earth, and indeed it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. And God said to Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them, and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. All flesh. All flesh. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And when I was first saved, born again in, in, the, in the 70s, God said to me, daughter, you are living in the days of Noah. So we've been living, and it, I'm quite sure what's going on before then. But God called me at that given time because he was trying to get the, the church ready for this dispensation of time. Then Genesis chapter 7, verse 1 said, then, then the Lord said to Noah, Come into the ark, you and all your household, because I have seen that you are righteous before me in this generation. You should take with you seven each of every clean animal, a male and his female, two each of animals that are unclean, a male and his female, also seven each of birds of the air, male and female, to keep the species alive on the face of all the earth. For after seven more days I will cause it to rain on the earth, forty days and forty nights, and I will destroy from the face of the earth all living things that I have made. And Noah did according to all that the Lord commanded him. Noah was six hundred years old when the flood waters were on the earth. See, God set everything in place. Then he destroyed the earth. He had everything set up. He knew exactly how long he was going to have it to rain. He knew exactly what he wanted to be alive when the rain stopped. And he set it all up. And I'm hearing him say, I'm not a haphazard God, like some claim that I am. I always do everything decent and in order. And this is what God wants each one of us to do. Quit being haphazard and do everything decent and in order and make sure we know exactly how we're going to walk this thing out. All right, what's the first question that usually pops into your mind when thinking about the subject of what should I do to be prepared for God's coming judgment? We need to know the mind of the Lord in these trying times. Everybody's situation is different, so we need guidelines or principles to follow that will apply or work for everyone. You know, when you stop to think about it, when God, you know, he told Noah, I want you to build an ark. It, it didn't rain in those days, you know. The 
how everything was watered was from the dew from the earth. And so Noah knew that he was going to be made fun of because what did he need an ark for? And if you read the word, people did make fun of him the whole time he was building the ark. Now, God's going to ask you to do things in this end time dispensation because we know that we are preparing the way for the second coming of Jesus Christ. And we know that, like Noah, as we go forth and, you know, at God's command and do what he's asking us to do, sometimes it's going to be something that's never been done before. Never has there been, was there an ark built before Noah built one. And so if God's asked, God asks you to do something that you have never, never heard of before, and your mind's right, you're not flaky somewhere, then you have to do what God is calling you forth to do. Because he is trying to get everything in order for the second coming of Jesus Christ. When is the second, second coming coming? I don't know. I really don't care. Jesus doesn't know himself. It's that only the Father in heaven knows. All God told me, you just work the works that I've called you for to do. And he will come at an appointed time. All right? So we aren't working saying, oh, Jesus is going to come tomorrow. Well, I thought Jesus was coming in the seventies. <laughs> Dropped all my insurance policies, quit college. You know, I did all those dumb things. <laughs> then I had to pick it all up again. So we're just going to work the works of every day, and we're just going to do the things the Father wants us to do. All right. I said everybody's situation is different, so we need guidelines or principles to follow that will apply our work or work for everyone. To prepare ourselves, we must first follow the principles taught in the Bible, which are to prepare ourselves spiritually. If you aren't spiritually right for God, you might as well forget about anything else. And God's been trying to get the body of Christ now for over 40 years to get right with him and stay right. It was the key to Noah's success during God's judgment in his day. It was a key to those in Israel who saw their needs met when God had to judge Israel. And it will be the key to our success as God's judgment falls on America. And whether you want to believe this or not, God is judging America. It's God's judgment. Why is he judging us? Because we have totally left him. And we have fallen away of following the way of Baal. It has been that way since the beginning of mankind. You know, we have to prepare ourselves spiritually. It was a key to Noah's success during God's judgment in his day. It was a key to those in Israel who saw their needs met when God had to judge Israel. And it will be the key to our success as God's judgment falls on America. It has been that way since the beginning of mankind. The Lord has always been faithful to meet the needs of those who are faithfully following him and his ways. God, the Lord has always been faithful to meet the needs of those who are faithfully following him and his ways. Any Christian willing to face reality must admit that we are in serious trouble today. What was unthinkable a generation ago has now become commonplace. Now, some of you who were in sin when you came to God don't understand what I'm saying, but there, in years past, there was peace and there was joy and there was comfort. You went in the house of God. You heard the word. You sang a few songs and went home. And you didn't go home to sin. You went home to, to be to, just to walk out your walk with God. But nowadays, that isn't how it is. And even when people get saved, born again, whatever they do, they still keep their sin nature. And that will not take you to heaven. You have to get rid of your sin nature if you're going to one day sit in heavenly places with the Father. So that's the thing we have to work on right now when our walk with God, staying saved, staying holy and staying righteous. And it isn't easy because the enemy is constantly coming against you, trying to keep you bound or take you back from whence you came. So where am I at here? The moral... The moral fiber that bound our nation and our people together for centuries has unraveled. If you notice, there's really no peace out there in the world. Is there, Aaron, when you're doing your little route? There's no peace out there. There's no joy out there. There's turmoil every place you look. The family, the most fundamental means of preserving 
social order has been shattered. There's no such thing as family anymore. You either have one parent or no parent. It's not two parents. Or you have two women and two men. <laughs> you know, it's not family anymore. Greed and unethical conduct have tainted prof professions. Doctors, bankers, lawyers, politicians, educators, some spiritual leaders, so forth, that have historically represented the pillars of society. When you look at doctors, bankers, lawyers, politicians, educators, and some spiritual leaders, you see corruption in them. It didn't used to be. When I was young, growing up, it was not that way. But it is today. Society has changed drastically. America's great cities, once the principal evidence of a mighty industrial nation, are stalked by crime and violence. You know, I've heard that the, uh, the uh, Philadelphia drug lords have come to Wilmington and taken the drug place here. So Wilmington now has come to Dover to take the drug places here. And there's drug wars all over the place. And people are being shot and they don't think anything of shooting somebody. You didn't used to see that. Sexual immorality and lifestyles devoted to self-gratification have transformed the American character. Sexual immorality and lifestyles devoted to self-gratification <coughs> excuse me, have transformed the American character. Public schools, once the showpiece of a young democracy, have surrendered to drug abuse, sex, and criminal evidence. And I just read where one school in New York, vaping has taken over 75% of the school. That's sad. You didn't used to see that kind of stuff in schools. Our government has turned its back on the scriptural principles that form the moral foundation of the nation. Americans have reserved their most vicious attack for children through abortion and child abuse. You didn't used to hear that either. America has discarded the biblical standards on which our nation was founded as fast as yesterday's news. If you can get away with it, then it's all right, has become the slogan of many people. And I've heard that, and that makes me sick. You know, you might be getting away with it, but God's watching everything you're doing. He sees everything. Personal accountability, respect for authority, and self-control have become old-fashioned ways of thinking. Nothing, it seems, is, is indecent or repugnant. Like, everything's go. Just do it. Rules are prohibited. Everything is permissible. Nothing deserves to be honored and respected. I've never seen an, a, a dispensation of time where kids are so disrespectful to their families their parents. But then I've never seen a dispensation of time where parents aren't anything to look up to either. Yeah, I really haven't. It's getting worse and worse. We know that our days are similar to of Noah. Therefore, we need to see what the attitude and activities of Noah were before the great flood. It, you know, God said, we are living in the days of Noah, so let's see what was going on then. Hebrews 11 verse 6 says, but without faith, it is impossible to please God, for he who comes to God must believe that he is, that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. And by faith Noah, by faith Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household, by which he condemned the world, and became heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. So the first thing that caused Noah to prepare himself and his family was his faith. He believed God's warning. And I can guarantee you, some of you in here do not walk by faith. You do not believe God's warning. Because he's been warning us and warning us, and still a sin nature is in you that you yield yourself to constantly. To prepare ourselves for these last days before we do anything else, we must believe that God's judgment is going to fall. And you're really, truly, if you talk about God judging you, people get all upset, don't they? Because all they want to hear about is a loving, kind God who just closes his eyes and lets you do whatever you want to and still takes you to heaven. That's not, not, that's not the God of the Bible that I read. And aren't you glad, aren't some of you glad... <laughs> 
that God isn't like that, where he closes his eyes and lets you do whatever you want to, because there's enough hell here in this earth, and I sure don't want to go to heaven. I, I work hard every day to go to heaven. I don't know if I'll go there or not, but I'm working hard to do that. I do not want to go to heaven and, and have to sit with that again. All right? All right, I said to prepare ourselves for these last days before we do anything else, we must we must believe that God's judgment is going to fall. When? We don't know the exact time. How? We can only speculate. Will we still be alive? We don't know. God's judgment's already falling, and we are still alive, and his judgments don't look good at all. You know, when you turn on the news and here's this big earthquake in California, where it was here not too long ago, and now you have this virus running around rampant, and you have all these killings taking place, and, you know, and all this trafficking going on. It, you know, it's a mess. We are in a bad state. All right. These things are not the issue. The issue is, before we will accept direction from God and His Word, about what we should do to prepare ourselves, we must first believe what God's word warns us about. And I'm hearing God say, some of you in here, you're going to be writing books revealing what God is warning us about. There are going to be books that haven't yet been written because God's going to unveil the secrets that's hidden in the word. And then people are going to read these books and it's going to lead them in the path of righteousness. All things in our relationship with the Lord begin with our faith. The same truth applies in this situation. If we don't believe that judgment is coming, and in some areas it has already begun, then we won't be willing to step out in faith to follow the Lord's leading in how we should prepare. A lot of people say this is not God, God judging America. Yes, it is is yes it is and when god starts stirring up the deep things it's in, dark things that's inside of you god at this point is judging you and he's bringing these things up to the surface so he so he can deal with them but you have to say god all right this is not this stuff is not of you i give you permission to deal with this junk get it out of me so i can one day sit in heavenly places with you all right, the second important thing we learned about Noah's preparation was his attitude. After receiving a warning from God, which he believed, he stepped out in faith with an attitude of holy fear within his character and took action. This is critical. Holy fear is what motivates humans to adhere to God's standards and not give in to worldly standards. Let's read that again. Holy fear is what motivates humans to adhere to God's standards and not give in to worldly standards. But when you're bound and you don't have a holy fear for God, you're not going to be set free. I've never seen a, a dispensation of time when people do not fear God. There is a holy fear of God that each one of us need to have, and that holy fear is what's going to keep us from going to hell. That holy fear is going to cause us to, to want God to judge us and to want God to clean us up so that we do go to heaven. You need a holy fear of God. I, you know, I love my earthly father, but I sure feared him too and him this little belt that he had but i loved him desperately and completely and i love my father in heaven too and my father in heaven chastises me when i do something wrong and i thank him for it all right godly standards have been, have been lost in no i'm sorry godly standards had been lost in noah's day but hebrews 11 7 in holy fear noah built and so let's read hebrews 11 7 by faith, Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household, by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness, which is according to faith. Noah built that ark, according to this, to save his household. 
It said Noah was a righteous man. It doesn't say his whole household was. Noah was a righteous man. Now, walking in holy fear led Abraham to take action to save his family. He trusted in God and his word completely. His obedience was foremost in his mind because he had a proper fear or respect for the Lord. Now, we're talking about Abraham there. We're not talking about Noah. Walking in holy fear led Abraham to take action to save his family. Deuteronomy chapter 3, verse 12, Learn to fear the Lord your God. Learn to fear the Lord your God. Psalm 34, 7, The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him, and he, and he delivers them. Proverbs sixteen six: Through the fear of the Lord, a man avoids evil. Proverbs 8.13, to fear the Lord is to hate evil. 1 Peter 1.17, live your lives as strangers here in reverent fear. In Acts 9.31, then the church was strengthened and encouraged by the Holy Spirit, living in the fear of the Lord. People just don't fear the Lord anymore. Uh, pastors don't feel the, the fear of the Lord. They do whatever they want to, get behind a pulpit and preach things they're not living. No fear that God could strike them dead right then and there. Then the congregation watches the pastor, so okay, the pastor's doing this, so I can do it too. I told you my one sister who lived in Florida, when I went down there to, to marry her, um, she wanted me to go to a bar. I said, I don't go to bars. She said, why not? I said, well, I shouldn't be in a bar. And it was in a bar to eat, but still in all, they all were drunk, going to get drunk in there. She said, my pastor goes to the bar with me every Sunday. We get drunk together. I said, that doesn't make it right. She said, but he's a lot of fun. Well, that's fine, but that doesn't make it right. The word of God doesn't tell us to do that. Now, if you're going to go to a bar to witness, that's one thing. But if you're going to go to a bar to, get dr to drink and to get drunk, that's a totally different story. Because it said that, that Jesus himself sat with the, the, um, the drinkers, right? Now, I'm going to tell you right now, if you drink and you carouse, God is not going to send you into a bar to minister to the people. Come on, get out of here. You're just using that as an excuse to go and get drunk. And I've heard people say that, too. Where am I at? These are, these are just a few. Oh, These are just a few of the many verses that touch on the subject of having a proper fear of the Lord. To have a holy fear is to stand in awe of and have a deep respect for God's holiness and his standards. To have a proper holy fear of the Lord means, number one, to seek his will in all things. Number two, to examine every aspect of what is going on in our life with God's word. Now, not being in God's will should be a deep concern and a driving force behind every thought and action. Not being in God's will should be a deep concern and a driving force behind every thought and every action. One of the things you should want to hear God say when you get a prophetic word is, you're in my perfect will. <laughs> I mean, that you really, need, you really should want to hear that more than anything else that you want to hear from God. Now, holy fear says, is this pleasing to God? When you're doing something, is this pleasing to God? Holy fear develops a heart that is pure, open to conviction and repentance. Holy fear develops a heart that is pure, open to conviction and repentance. It allows the Lord to open our spiritual eyes. Holy fear gives us discernment. Come on. To keep in line spiritually, a Christian needs to have a fear of the Lord. If we don't have a proper holy fear, we will take certain spiritual things for granted. We lose our sensitivity and alertness to the influence of the world around us. We can easily develop spiritual pride and take liberties which will not only affect our spiritual walk, but will hurt others. And without holy fear, our heart can quickly become hypocritical in certain areas. You know, Ted, who came you know, with the liver cancer to die, he wanted to die with his family, he said to me, I was here two weeks, and God told me that if I died at that moment, I was going to hell, and that he brought me here so I could get saved, properly saved, 
and go to heaven. And then he walked through that thing. He worked he worked worked at it and walked through it. And the day he died, he went to heaven to be with the Father. But he thought, and he because he went to church all the time, read his daily uh, bread or whatever that little booklet is every morning faithfully. And he thought it because he did those acts that he was had a sure place in heaven. But he found out he didn't. He had to get certain things right in his life. He had to get things right with certain people. And he had to really then start thinking differently. And then when he finally made his decision, he said, there, I'm, I'm at a crossroads. There's a road going to the right and a road going to the left. Which one should I take? He was asking me that. The whole family was there. But I said, take the one to the right. Always take the right road. He said, okay. Then I'm going to take the right road. I'm going to go the road to the right. And he says, and Jesus is on that road. And at that point, he had made the right decision. He, he received Jesus, and then he was ready to go home. Now, see, we look at people. I knew he wasn't right, by the way. <laughs> I just knew he wasn't. and But he would never listen to me before, and so I just was quiet, and God made the way for this to happen. When you're sitting in the house of God and you look at people, you would be totally shocked at what's behind that flesh. They can do all kind of godly things, but never be really saved. And they don't have the fear of the Lord. And if God brings something up that they're doing wrong, they get instantly angry. How dare you say this about me? Now, if you were born with, now, you know, you guys have got tattoos. You did before you knew it better. But if you was born with a mark in your body, you'd throw it fit. But you willingly, willingly go out and mark your body, right? Uh, you, you need to think about these things. And then you blame God because you were you were born with a mole on your face. <laughs> I'm just you know, I'm just trying to get you to think about things. How dare he? You know? But yet you go out and do all kind of dumb things to your body. I want you to think about this. You have no right to be mad at God. You really don't. Holy fear. Holy fear. We do not have a fear of sinning like we should. We become negligent in seeking righteousness. To be prepared for the coming judgment will require the same on our part as it did on Noah's day. It says that the people were beaten on the ark and one they went in the ark, but they made fun of Noah while he was building it and they kept sinning. They didn't and he was preaching the whole time he was building that ark, and but yet they didn't change their ways until <laughs> the door was shut and the flood came. And what did God tell us in here? The river was flowing wide and flowing deep. If you didn't get in now, when it, whenever the glory did drop, you were gonna be saying, I went in, I went in, and God said, No, too late. You didn't go the night I told you you should go. It's too late now. And God had me teach about the ten virgins. Five had oil, five did not. And they couldn't get in. They couldn't get in. By the time they got their oil, the door had, master had shut the door. The matter, matter if you try to get your oil lamp full after the fact, it, you just won't be able to get in. You're going to have to get a holy fear of the Father. If your standards as a Christian allow you to walk along the edge of darkness, then it is a sure indication that you don't have the kind of holy fear towards God that Noah had and what scripture, scripture talk about. I, I have a holy fear and I pray every day, God, please don't let me miss you. Please don't let me do something dumb and stupid the day that would cause me to go to hell. If I was, you know, about the time I was doing something dumb and stupid, that's when the devil would take my life. Please keep me in the safe place always. We must strive to stay as far away as possible from worldly standards and give no advantage to Satan. Our mindset must be to have a strong desire to avoid sin at every turn, and that's my desire. To walk uprightly in a manner pleasing to God and to live in the awe of the Lord. That is what it will take to build the ark we need to keep us safe from the pressures, temptations, and trials of our day. I'm sorry, guys. Following God is not an easy path. 
it's one struggle after another. But God has promises, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And he's always there with us. I always think about Paul. Paul had a wonderful life killing Christians. <laughs> you know, he had everything he could possibly want. Then God just knocks him off his donkey, blinds him, and says, I want you to follow me. And from that point on, Paul was in prison more than he was out of prison. And, you know, before he, he was one throwing people into prison, now they were throwing him into prison. He was in stocks and bonds, but yet he sang and praised God. He had a holy fear of the Father. And he didn't complain about what God put him through. Judgment waits around the corner. We, you really need to understand as judgment does wait. You just don't know when God is going to pull that final judgment on you. You really don't. Judgment waits around the corner. So we must do what Noah did. We must start with a proper fear of the Lord. Other scriptures you can study at home about God's judgment are Isaiah chapters 1 through 5. Isaiah chapters 1 through 5. Now, Second Chronicles seven thirteen says, When I shut up heaven, this is God speaking, When I shut up heaven and there is no rain, or command the locusts to devour the land, or send pestilence among my people, this is God going to do all this. See this? It's not the devil. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. Second Chronicles 7.13 says, When I shut up heaven and there is no rain, or command the locusts to devour the land, or send pestilence among my people, if my people who are called by na my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. The first if condition is will humble themselves. You really have a hard time finding Christians who want to be humble. We might do the other things mentioned in this verse. We might pray, seek God's face, and turn from our wicked ways. But if we have not first humbled ourselves, it looks like God cannot lift his hand of judgment from you. One of God's purposes in bringing judgment upon a person or a nation is to humble them. But I've noticed when God brings judgment upon somebody, they get mad at him. They speak all manner of evil against him. Then they start coming against his children. Have you noticed that? One of God's purposes in bringing judgment upon a person or a nation is to humble them or deal with the pride in their hearts. Pride stands in the way of true love. To give of oneself, which is the very nature of God. Pride is the opposite of being broken. A heart God revives is a humble and broken heart. Let's read that again. Pride stands in the way of true love to give of oneself. True love gives of yourself, which is the very nature of God. Pride is the opposite of being broken. A heart revives, I'm sorry, a heart God revives is a humble and broken heart. Now, while I'm talking, you can write down those scriptures there that you can look at when you go home. As I was typing this the other night, you know, I thought about, you know, some pastors in this area don't want to deal with me because I have children who, you know, do drugs. But, you know, God told me when I first was born again to take my daughter into my home, which was on drugs, and love her, and he would bring her through this situation. He said, if you don't love her, the world will, and you already see the results of the world loving her. Pastors try to get me to kick her onto the street, but I won't do that. And I even today, you know, pastors, uh, they come against me because of that. But it says, as you see, you're, if you see someone in need and you don't help them, you're worse than an infidel, right? And read, read about what God says about that. I'm, you know, I'm not telling you to do what God calls me to do. I am not. But I am saying that God wants you to help those who cannot help themselves. 
and we all know that somebody's an alcoholic, somebody's a drug addict, somebody's into per- perversion. They're deeply rooted in that junk, and they can't get out of it by themselves. They need somebody who will sell out to God totally and completely. Don't worry about what you're going to get out of it. You be concerned about the soul that God's trying to bring into his kingdom. Are you listening here tonight? See, and we're too much about, well, what about me? What about me? What am I going to get out of it? Hopefully one day you'll get your crown. (laughs) And then when we come back down here for a thousand years, and we're going to help rule and reign here on the earth. We're going, to help, we're going to help God set up his kingdom down here for a thousand years of peace. So don't worry about what you're getting out of it now. What are you going to get out of it in the long run? See, the world thinks that way. It's what am I going to get out of it right now? I don't care what's going to happen in a week now. I want what I want right now. And a child of God is supposed to be peculiar. A child of God is supposed to be different. And so it's not what we're going to get out of it. It's what is God getting out of it, and he's getting a soul. He needs somebody that will sell out to him totally and completely, have a reverent fear of him, that he can call on in in the time of need for another person's soul. Some of you young kids who are still in school, you know, oh, I want to fit in. You don't have to fit in in school. I never fit in in school because I didn't drink, I didn't smoke, I didn't cuss, and I didn't date, ever. And one day we was walking, I had a girlfriend, not not a girlfriend like as today, <laughs> but um, and we was walking down the hallway and they called me a lesbian. I didn't know what that was. And she says, doesn't that bother you? I said, what? Well, didn't you hear what they called you? I said, yeah. She said, don't you know what that is? I said, no. And she said, that's a girl who, who likes another girl. And I said, well, I don't like another girl, so that doesn't bother me any. But because I didn't date and cuss and drink and smoke, they thought there was something wrong, and there was. I was a God child. I was different. I was peculiar. So, you know, why don't you kid? Why don't you be different? Why do you want to blend into the crowd? Be different. Stand out and let them see Christ in you. I didn't know. I just... That's just the way I lived. I didn't realize I was different. Unless somebody told me I was. So be different. You guys on your jobs, be different. Okay, now back to back to our teaching. Now pride has become one of our greatest spiritual problems in the American church. The second if condition in Second Chronicles seven fourteen is to pray. First we have to humble ourselves, and then we have to pray. And the third if is to seek God's face. The fourth if condition God required in time of judgment is to turn from their wicked ways. To turn from means to repent. You know, everybody was talking about this virus, so I went to God and I said, all right, God, I need to hear what you have to say about it. So he told me, and and I'm walking on now. You know, he's in control of everything. And if we trust him, we're not going to get sick. You know, don't. Why do you want to run to a testing center to see, do I have it? No, if you really trust in God, you don't have it, you know. And if you do have it, you're still well and going on, and so who cares? Just just walk on, because God's in control. All right, these are the things we must do to get back on the right track with God. Humble ourselves, pray, seek God's face, repent, and seek God's righteousness. Then God says, if we will do these things, then he says, will I hear from heaven, in other words, hear our prayers, and will forgive their sin and will heal their land, bring, which means bring revival. In you first. Revival has to start within each one of us. God can't go out to minister to a lost world with, in, using you if you're messed up. So he has to bring revival within you first. And then you'll take it to a classroom or you'll take it to your workplace or wherever on your little mail route. You know, God's formula for you and me to prepare ourselves for his coming judgment is as follows. First, we must believe God's warning that his judgment is coming. Then we are to move with a holy fear in our hearts to build an ark of protection, which today would primarily be a spiritual ark. 
we must follow his instructions of humbling ourselves, praying, seeking his face, repenting, seeking his righteousness, and experiencing revival in our heart. These are his ingredients to build our spiritual ark of protection before the Lord. If we do this, we will be prepared. His promises is his promises to heal our land, which is our heart, and provide for our needs. All right. Now I want to stop there. I got because as I was talking, God might remind me something about tattoos. One time years back, it was the thing going that you have eyebrows tattooed on your face. All right. So I was going to do this, and I thought that'd be a neat thing. Not to, have to worry about if you're eyebrows are constantly on your eyebrow area and I went and talked to the lady that does it it was $700 I thought wow $700 well I said well that's a little much and she said well if you decide to change your mind just come back then a couple I didn't do it and a couple years later I got the I got the laughing and I got this thing if I'd had eyebrows tattooed they'd be down in here now <laughs> you know all right, you know, anybody has tattoos. I have older people at my house. Their tattoos now don't look like tattoos. They just look like smeared ink hanging, you know. So, so you need to stop and really think really hard. Are you going to get a tattoo? <laughs> because God said, don't mark your body. Don't pierce your body. All right. Back to business, right? Isaiah 54, 14 is a word from the Lord for those who are willing to make the proper preparation. It states, In righteousness you will be established. Tyranny will be far from you. You will have nothing to fear. Terror will be far removed. It will not come near you. If anyone does attack you, it will not be my doing. Whoever attacks you will surrender to you. See, it is I who created the blacksmith, who fans the coals into flame and forges a weapon fit for its work. And it is I who have created the destroyer to work havoc. No weapon formed against you will prosper, and you will refute every tongue that accuses you. This is a heritage of the servants of the Lord, and this is their vindication from me, declares the Lord. Now, I'm going to have to toot my own horn because years ago God said to me daughter go read Isaiah 54 you can stand on that scripture until the day I bring you home so I, I knew I didn't know then but I've learned in the years gone by that because I followed righteousness because I would not bow to anything that the enemy tried to send my way I can stand on Isaiah 54 there's no weapon formed against me that shall ever prosper and, you know, Isaiah 54 is a powerful, the whole, he gave me the whole scriptures, it's not 14 through 17. And it even says in there, I was upset for, with you for a while. <laughs> and he said, but he says, in my loving kindness, I have gathered you back to myself. So if you read Isaiah 54, it's a very, very good scripture for you if you will get in a holy fear of the Father. Now, when we talk about judgment, I know God is judging the world, but you one day will stand in God's judgment too. And right now, when God is, is separating the sheep from the goats, His people, His church is being judged. It has been being been judged for quite some time. Which side did you end up in? On? Did you end up with the sheep or with the goats? And only you and God know where you ended up. I, I'm really wanting to tell you tonight that what you need to do is cry out. If you don't have a holy fear of the Lord, you need to cry out to God and say, give me that holy fear, Father. Let me check myself every day to make sure I'm in right standing with you. Let me be so fearful of you, Father God, that there's nothing in this world that will ever make me turn back to the old me that I will be what you've called me forth to be, a holy, righteous person. You know, God doesn't want his bride, doesn't, isn't supposed to have any spot or any wrinkle. He doesn't want any sin on you. So are you really free from sin? 
you know, are you really at a place of holiness with God that that the enemy can in no way find any way to get into you? I want you to just take a few minutes to think about that. And then the altar's open for those of you who want to truly walk in holy fear.